We're recording. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Have a great presentation, everybody. Hi, and welcome to the 2020 Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition EJ Summit virtual style. Everyone, thank you so much for joining. We'd like you to sit down, relax for an experience to learn, listen, and grow. Activate some around some of the most important issues of our time. Today, we're building the kind of future that we want to see. We've had a lot of amaz amazing sessions. I encourage you to go on michiganej.org to check out the amazing things that are happening. Um, we have so many talented uh, and skillful, smart, sophisticated, strategic minds um, during the EJ Summit. It's also a space for healing. We definitely leaned in on making space for healing justice. And as much as we can do that together, virtually, um, we're going to try. So for this session, I wanna welcome you to a really amazing group of now professionals, but uh, students of the University of Michigan uh, School for Environment and Sustainability. Um, they're going to present today uh, environmental justice tools for the 21st century, but I, I want to contextualize this a little bit. Um, in 2008, when I started working with the Sierra Club, uh, Rhonda Anderson, and with residents of 48217, Marathon Oil had just proposed an expansion of a 17 acre tar sands processing facility. And it was at a community session in a church that residents were saying, you know, it's not just this smokestack, it's that smokestack and that smokestack and that smokestack. And our bodies are cauldrons for all of these toxins coming in to our homes and impacting our health. That idea uh, was born in the environmental justice community and catalyzed into the halls of academia all over the nation for a study called the cumulative impact of environmental injustices, the cumulative impact of pollution. And it brought us to a moment in 2017, a conversation with Dr. Paul Mohai to ask, you know, what would it look like to do a cumulative impact assessment for the state of Michigan. Uh, Environmental Justice Tools for the 21st Century was born. And this presentation is the second part to a two-part uh, research project. Uh, the first part done by Brett Zuner, uh, Laura Greer, and Delia Mayor. So it, it, the researchers here pose a question. What are the lessons that Michigan can learn regarding environmental justice screening tools. And to answer that question, uh, with MEJC, uh, the researchers set the objectives to identify the states, state-specific EJ screening tools and understand how these tools are used in state-level decision-making and two, utilize that data for our informational interviews to roadmap best practices for the development and implementation of EJ screening tools for Michigan. This presentation provides a general overview of the objectives and methodologies, key findings, analysis from the research, and recommendations for the community in organizing and utilizing EJ screening tools to further campaigns for systemic change and environmental justice. So this research is critical. It catalyzes um, and has the potential to institutionalize ideas that were born in the community like cumulative impact. So I'm very proud to introduce Ariana uh, Zerva, Zervasi. Uh, sorry if I mispronounce that, Ariana Wakako Kobayashi, Brian Redden, Molly Blondell, our recent graduates from University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability and concentrated their respective studies in environmental justice, and they're committed to centering community voices and power in their research and actions to ensure a healthy, just, and equitable environment for all. So thanks so much, everyone, for bringing this forward for us and for advancing the fight for environmental justice. I'll hand the mic over to you.
Thank you, Michelle. Um, let me quickly just get our screening uh, screen share up. All right. Uh, hopefully, everybody can see our slides here on the call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's up. Okay, thanks, Brian. <laughs> um, so, hello, everyone. Again, thank you, Michelle, for introducing us. Um, my name is Ariana Zertsevi, and um, I am a recent graduate, as Michelle has said, of the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. On behalf of my colleagues, Wakako, Brian, and Molly, I would like to begin our presentation of our master's project work, Environmental Justice Tools for the 21st Century. As Michelle has said, this research was conducted in collaboration with the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition and was conducted in, from the years 2019 to 2020. To give everyone a brief overview of how our presentation is going to go today, we first would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Then we would like to give a brief introduction of our study, the historical background, our research question and objectives, and to go a little bit into uh, current state environmental justice screening tools. Then we will briefly discuss our methodology before going more in depth into our results and analysis. So for example, we are going to talk a little bit about the policies and programs that have been influenced by environmental justice screening tools. Then we will give our list of recommendations or best practices for Michigan to use as it moves forward with its environmental justice screening tool. And then again, we will briefly go over our limitations of our study, followed by a brief conclusion. Uh, we acknowledge that the University of Michigan resides on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Bodawadmi. We also acknowledge that the lands that we currently reside on are the traditional lands of indig indigenous peoples. In Florida, the Ice and Seminole. In Maryland, the Piscataway. In New Hampshire, the Penacook, the Abenaki, and the Wabanaki Confederacy. And in Japan, the Ainu and the people of Ryukyu. As we continue to work, play, and live on these territories, we encourage everyone to reflect on the ongoing effects of colonization on indigenous peoples and tribal sovereignty. With the statement, we affirm that acknowledgement is the first of many steps and that in order to support indigenous people and be good neighbors to and stewards of their homelands, we should take meaningful action towards decolonization. Now, I would like to introduce Wakako, who will be walking us through our introduction. Thank you, Ariana, for the introduction. Um, I will begin by give, uh, giving a brief overview of the history of EJ in the United States, then go on to introduce our research and methodology. Next slide, please. Environmental injustices have existed in the United States for decades specifically experienced by racial and ethnic minorities who have been living under the disproportionate effects of environmental pollution and hazards without proper protection from governmental agencies. However, EJ was not widely recognized as a public issue until the early 1980s, when people protested against the placing of a hazardous waste facility in a predominantly African-American community in Warren County, North Carolina. Following the protests was a thorough investigation by the United States government and a study by the United Church of Christ, which after a series of historical events led to the 1994 Presidential Executive Order on EJ that directs government agencies to develop strategies to identify and address environmental injustices. However, it is clear that these issues are still prevalent across the nation, especially in Michigan, where highly publicized and continuing cases such as Ambridge Line 5, the Flint water crisis, and the toxic air quality, quality and zip code 48217 continue to exist. Next slide, please. To investigate how to better mitigate these injustices and to achieve EJ at the local level, we looked into spatial mapping and screening tools, which have been used before to address these issues. In many reported cases on environmental injustice, Academics and government officials rely on data to corroborate the testimonies of affected communities. 
EJ screening tools combine soci socioeconomic data with environmental data, and some include health data, to visualize the areas with the greatest environmental injustices. Mohai and Saha's research has also shown that spatial analysis can examine the extent to which race and socioeconomic factors determine disproportionate burdens of hazardous waste. Screening tools are also a resource that can give people power and knowledge that help amplify their voices and have influence in the decision-making process. And for these reasons, our project focuses on EJ screening tools and how they can be used to help establish state EJ policies. Next slide, please. Our project is subsequent to a 2019 CS Master's project by Laura Greer, Brett Zuner, and Delia Mayor, which developed a Michigan-specific EJ and cumulative impact screening tool for state-level decision-making. Greer et al. used both quantitative and qualitative methodologies to assess the state of EJ in Michigan. In their quantitative analysis, they use metrics similar to California's Cal and Screen to rank census tracts within the state based on EJ scores. And in their qualitative analysis, they conducted interviews with local EJ activists, leaders, and community members. Their study produced a functional map, as shown here on the slide, which presented that environmental hazards occur in areas that typically are communities of color and low income. Next slide, please. Building from their research and to help mitigate environmental injustices in Michigan, our group aimed to answer the question, what are the lessons that Michigan can learn regarding EJ screening tools by addressing two objectives? Firstly, we wanted to identify states that use EJ screening tools and understand how they are used in decision-making. Secondly, we want to utilize data from our informational interviews to roadmap best practices for the development and implementation of these tools to serve communities in Michigan. Next slide, please. To meet these objectives, we identify a number of states that are currently using or developing EJ screening tools. After an initial review of reports and discussions with our advisor, we decided to focus on tools from California, Washington, Minnesota, Maryland, and New Jersey. I should mention that Connecticut, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Mexico, New York, and Pennsylvania also have EJ mapping tools. However, they were not included in our analysis because we focused on tools that met four criteria. First, that it served as a statewide tool. Second, that it combined socioeconomic, environmental, and or included health data to represent EJ issues. Third, that it visualized this data on an interactive online platform. And fourth, that this data was available to the public. Next slide, please. Uh, now I'd like to talk about our methodology. Next, please. As mentioned earlier, our team study, studied and gathered information about different state EJ screening tools through online research and published reports. Our next step was to conduct semi-structured interviews with EJ advocates and activists university academics, professionals, and state officials from within and outside Michigan who could give us insights on the challenges, barriers, successes, and failures of screening tools. We developed an interview guide that consisted of main questions and follow-up questions on relevant topics. These questions were verified by our advisor and pre-tested between groupmates before conducting the interviews. We then formed an initial list of interviewees after consulting with our advisor and project client on people to contact. To find additional interviewees, we initially used a snowball methodology where our interviewee would refer us to other potential subjects. However, not every interviewee was able to lead us to a new person of interest, so we shifted to a key informant sampling methodology. Our interviews were 30 to 60 minute conversations facilitated through online video conferencing softwares or by phone. We stored audio recordings upon the interview's consent, which were then transcribed verbatim. And lastly, to analyze their interview data, a codebook was developed on a qualitative analysis software using deductive codes based on the literature review and inductive codes based on emerging themes from their interviews. So next, I'd like to introduce Brian and Molly, who will be presenting on the results and analysis. All right, thank you for that, Coco. Um, 
All right, so for the next few slides, I'd like to discuss the results and analysis portion of our presentation. Here we will go into a little bit more depth about the main findings of our research and some of its implications. Slide, please. So regarding our research, there are some common themes that have been recurring over the course of conducting our research, and they include some of the following. First off, uh, we have understanding of EJ. How is it defined? As in, does this make a big impact on legislature and how policies are made surrounding it, as well as how it's framed? Uh, how are communities involved in the development of an EJ definition? Were state officials directly reaching out to commun community members and activists, such as through roundtables, feedback sessions, and other forms of communication? Whether or not screening tools existed in a respective state. Um, for example, it can give us an idea on how widespread the knowledge is surrounding these tools and gives us a look as to how EJ is being addressed. And how are EJ slash burden slash disadvantaged communities defined? How, for instance, are cumulative impacts defined, if at all, as this can have an impact on how EJ is perceived in the academic space as well as the public sphere, and it can allow for critical adjustments in the legislature. Next, we have development of screening tools. Were there opportunities for community engagement and participation? With this, we can think of it as, was community members' input sought out, valued, as well as incorporated? Where was the tool housed? Was it located or housed, for instance, by the state, a university or college system, or a separate organization altogether? This can make a significant difference regarding access uh, to the tool. And then we have timeline, as in just how long did it take for the tool to be developed, uh, as well as were there other engagements that allowed, that enabled for the tool to be developed. Next, we have use tools. How is the tool utilized or how is it planned on being utilized? For instance, was it used as a way to distribute information, whether through educational or advocacy means? Was it for policy creation or enforcement of current policies? such as dealing with environmental, urban planning, and other spaces? Was it used to create programs or implementation of those programs? Who uses the tool itself? The state administration, individual agencies, or even individual community members? Is it accessible to the public or only to specific actors? And as well as there being other tools that perhaps don't fit neatly under environmental justice screening tools, we found that some other tools have been labeled under um, health and emissions tracking, as well as other disciplines. Next slide, please. Next, we have limitations of the tool itself. Um, playing, for instance, the functionality of the tool, what can it actually measure and what does it analyze? Understanding this, we can see how the tool can be improved upon and what sort of data has already been incorporated into it. Next, we have resistance and overcoming resistance. What resistance has the tool faced currently as well as in the, or as well as in the past? We've seen resistance, for instance, with lawmakers, legislators, and with some instances being more explicit than others. What sort of communication was there between states and communities? We've also found instances where a state has been dragging its feet on communicating with community members as well as some state agencies not sharing the relevant info amongst one another, whether it was due to policy or simply withholding information outright. Finally, we have metrics of success. With this, we try to understand, has there been a measurable reduction in emissions as a result of using the tool after a period of time? Uh, this is often considered as well the most important public health concern. Uh, through the use of the tool, was there, were there any changes in the permitting processes? Has, for instance, industry and states um, been denied permits or has the process been adjusted to allow for cumulative impacts as one example? Has there been funding allocated to communities and state programs slash agencies once the tool has been used? Um, this is for addressing environmental hazards and perhaps increasing community resilience. Finally, um, improving collaboration between state agencies 
and communities as a result of using the tool? Have state agencies been more willing or been more outright in sharing their data? Next, I'd like to pass it on to Molly Blondell, who will share the rest of our resulting analysis. Thank you, Brian. While most of our research focuses on screening tool development and general plans of use, we also believe it's important to introduce the kinds of policies and programs that can possibly result from a screening tool. Here, it is important that we distinguish policies from programs. Policies, in our view, encompasses all official actions by a government body. These actions can include regulations, which are typically created within state agencies and may not have legislative approval. Um, executive orders and, of course, laws that are passed by a legislative body. However, while policies are actions by a governmental body, not all policies are actionable, meaning that not all policies have goals, a timeline, or budgetary requirements. So we consider state programs to encompass serviceable state actions that typically, typically have a purpose upon enactment, uh, a timeline to implement change, and state department affiliation from which to draw funds. Screening tools typically have informed state or city policies by using criteria of affected communities. Now, once these communities are identified used a, using a screening tool, policies are created to, one, allocate resources through funds or benefit from government programs, two, prevent further environmental hazards from reaching these regions, or three, change decision-making processes to consider the needs of affected communities. We have found examples of policies informed by screening tools in California, Washington, Minnesota, and New Jersey, with California being the most extensive in its use thus far. And to our knowledge, California was the only state of our research sample that had any state programs using the tool thus far. Again, similar to state policies, these programs use California's CalEnvirus screens thresholds for disadvantaged communities to offer a variety of benefits. These benefits range from certain wattage of renewable energy under the Green Tariff Shared Renewables Program to community grants to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions under the Transformative Climate Communities Program. And we would also like to mention the various EJ policies that are not informed through the use of an EJ screening tool. Uh, these policies address issues that contribute to environmental injustice, such as bans on pollutants, public health codes, land use, proactive planning, review processes, and the creation of EJ specific policies and programs. And these policies typically occur on a smaller scale within the legal context of a city ordinance or county law. And though they are developed through different means, we also argue that EJ policies are impactful regardless of their strategies and regardless of a tool being used in their development. Uh, next slide, please, Ariana. When discussing the merits of screening tools, we also must acknowledge their various limitations for campaign action. To start, the utility of a screening tool is only as good as the data that could be placed into the tool. So this calls for more data that is specific to the state of Michigan, so the tool can best represent Michiganders. However, as industries are expected to report their own emissions, there's also a risk of missing and inconsistent data from these unreliable sources. One potential point of intervention on this matter would be to reinvest in community monitoring stations and their respective upkeep to ensure that community members have the power to cover gaps in data and to corroborate data from self-reporting industries. Another would be to demand more transparency and funding and compensation from the state of Michigan to support community data collection. We also acknowledge that screening tools predominantly address the environmental injustice of cumulative impacts, while other examples of environmental injustices, such as access to green spaces, access to safe and nutritious foods, and energy and security, among many others, are not necessarily highlighted by a screening tool. While this is a significant limitation, we also argue that EJ screening tools may be critical to informing communities about how one environmental injustice may exacerbate other environmental injustices. Next slide. And finally, we recognize that EJ screening tools are important to mapping and conveying cumulative impacts to a number of stakeholders. But we will also acknowledge that 
there are many aspects where this tool can be regarded as problematic in its distinction of communities. Communities and organizers are often given this task to find enough data that will validate their experience of communities in the eyes of decision makers who doubt their testimonies. And where can community members find, as Michelle Martinez frames, this holy grail of data that will suddenly make industry and state decision makers hold themselves accountable? Further, the process of categorizing lived experiences of communities into data often limits its ability to convey socio-historical context and human relationships that comprise an individual data point. A data point cannot convey the work and compassion community members place in their resiliency and mutual aid networks, nor can it convey the interpersonal connections felt between community members. EJ screening tools and the data that comprise them must support community members and organizers who do not engage, who uh, must support community members and organizers engaging in campaign actions to seek validation of their experiences. But community members don't seek this validation. They demand resolution and steadfast remediation. Um, I will now pass the presentation to Ariana, who will discuss our recommendations developed from our research and analysis. Thank you, Molly. Um, so from our results and analysis, we have drafted a series of 12 recommendations for Michigan to use as best practices as it moves forward with potentially its own state-specific environmental justice screening tool. We would like to preface that these recommendations were originally made in the context of talking to state officials as we envisioned the tool existing within a state body, um, as we will discuss a little bit later. Uh, however, we also think that in the context of campaign action, these 12 recommendations, because these are best practices, these can be things that community members can hold officials accountable to. Um, uh, you know, as this tool is developed over time at the state level. So our first recommendation is that Michigan must establish a state definition of environmental justice in law, meaning through state legislation, as well as specific criteria to define an EJ community. We suggest that the state first build from the US EPA definition of environmental justice, which we can see here, um, which many other states have done, Defining EJ as well as the criteria that comprise an affected community should be an in-depth and collaborative process with community members. And this collaboration should continue um, should these definitions alter over time. Our second recommendation is that state officials must conduct multiple public hearings, workshops, and roundtables to ensure community involvement in the tool's development. These community outreach efforts should be held in multiple languages to ensure understanding from all communities. And they should also be held while keeping in mind the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So for example, considering disability access. Additionally, many of these community members um, come from low income households or from households with fewer resources. And for that reason, these workshops should be held keeping in mind certain time restraints so these workshops should not be held during standard work hours, for example. Our third recommendation is that state officials must also incorporate other stakeholders into development decisions, such as tribal communities, academics, and industries. At this point, we should say that all stakeholder representation must be equal. So for example, industry representation cannot outweigh community voices at any particular conversation. And, um, Social disparities, such as differences in political clout, must also be acknowledged. Our fourth and fifth recommendations pertain to the location of the screening tool. The fourth being that the EJ screening tool must be housed within a state agency rather than an outside institution. From our research, we have found that this will allow for the most stable infrastructure and access to resources that might not be available if the screening tool is housed in an outside ins institution or an academic institution. Additionally, multiple state agencies um, must collaborate on the tool's creation and use. 
while we envision the tool to exist within the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, we encourage multiple state agencies such as DHHS or LEO to collaborate on the tool's creation, specifically sharing relevant uh, health or economic data, for example, and to use the information from the tool to inform better practices throughout multiple state departments. Our sixth recommendation is that Michigan should follow the examples of other states, specifically California, to create a screening tool more efficiently. When we say more efficiently, we mean in a shorter period of time. We argue that Michigan communities need a tool urgently, and for that reason, they shouldn't have to feel that they have to reinvent the wheel in order to create a state-specific um, EJ screening tool. They can use the methodologies created by other states, like the previous master's project group has done, and we can see here, um, to create a draft version of a Michigan-specific screening tool. Obviously, we acknowledge that in future iterations of the tool, there should be more Michigan-specific data added to it. But in the interim, we think that using something like the Greer et al. 2019 tool seen here to inform, for example, the definitions of EJ or the definition of an environmental justice community um, is worthwhile. Our seventh recommendation is that Michigan must increase community monitoring efforts over time so that more data can be collected for the tool. This is something that Molly spoke to um, a little bit previously. Um, we believe that as more information is collected for the tool, the community must be regularly consulted in major updates to the tool so that the public is aware of what has changed in respect to their community. Incidentally, this recommendation is very similar to a recommendation that was made to Governor Snyder in 2018 um, as part of the Environmental Justice Workgroup, as we can see here. So again, this is a, continue, uh, a continuing effort that must be made in Michigan from multiple sources. Our eighth and ninth recommendations talk about uh, the function of the tool, what purpose it would serve at the state level, the eighth being that Michigan can and should use an EJ screening tool for education, advocacy, and regulatory purposes statewide to address potential resistance of the tool being used for these different functions. Michigan may frame the screening tool as serving an educational or informative purpose in addition to its regulatory purpose, but we believe that the tool can be used for all of these things. Our ninth recommendation is that the tool should be used at different levels of governance, so not just as the state level at a, in a state department, but it can also be used countywide and citywide to ensure that all communities are identified for their specific needs. Our tenth recommendation is that all governance levels must communicate health and safety concerns to community members and provide resources such as financial assistance or greater access to uh, healthcare facilities for affected community members to respond to their needs. Our 11th recommendation is that Michigan state officials must consult communities as to the goals and metrics of success for the tool and create timelines to meet those goals. We did not find many instances where there were specific goals such as a reduction of emissions um, that states used. And we think that that would be a helpful way to keep the state accountable for the tool's use over time. And finally, Michigan should aim to implement both local and state EJ policies as they approach EJ problems at different scales, as we've mentioned previously, the difference between a state policy versus something as small as a city ordinance. We believe that having EJ policies set at both the state and local level will strengthen the overall accountability of the tool itself. So now that we have presented our recommendations, we would like to concede that there were a few limitations of our study. The first being our sample size. We originally aimed to um, conduct 30 interviews over the course of our research, because that is uh, a certain threshold for statistical significance. However, due to the current coronavirus pandemic, our research was uh, interrupted in 
uh, the winter of last year, and therefore we can only conduct 26 interviews. That being said, we still think that our research with 26 interviews um, holds weight. We also may have um, encountered some sampling bias um, during the course of our research. So for example, we did not have even numbers of interviewees between states or between actor groups. For example, academics may have outweighed state voices in particular states, and this may have skewed our results in that direction. Additionally, we may have encountered selection bias given the way that we found out about our state tools which was through published reports and ej researchers we may have overlooked some tools additionally we did not talk to any industry reps in any of our states and the majority of our ej community members came from urban rather than rural environmental justice communities and this may have affected how certain states were represented and finally given the way that we conducted our interviews which was through video online conferencing software most commonly, there were times when connectivity was an issue on the call. Now to conclude our presentation, I'm going to hand the reins back over to Molly. Thank you, Ariana. So to conclude, this project sought to answer the question of what are the lessons that Michigan can learn regarding EJ screening tools? As a result of our research and analysis, we created a series of 12 recommendations for Michigan state officials and community members. And our recommendations and analysis also insist that collaboration with communities is vital to determine a state specific definition of environmental justice, criteria to describe affected communities, and the environmental, socioeconomic, and health factors to be measured by a screening tool. It is the right of communities to not only be included at the proverbial table while decisions are being made, but to have equitable authority to make decisions in these processes. Michigan's EJ screening tool therefore must support community testimonies to advance campaign actions that may ensure community members live and thrive together. I will pass the presentation to Coco for our acknowledgements. Oops, sorry, thank you, Molly. Uh, before ending this presentation, we would like to express our deepest gratitude to Michelle Martinez, the state coordinator of MEJC, for providing us continued guidance on this project and to thank the MEJC for giving us an opportunity to present at the summit. We would like to thank our faculty advisor, Dr. Paul Mohai, for his constant, uh, for his constant support through this process. We would like to thank all of our interviewees for taking the time to share their knowledge and perspectives and for trusting us with that information. Lastly, thank you to our audience for listening to this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, if you have any additional questions regarding our research, please do not hesitate to contact us at this email address. And to view our full report, please visit the link below. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you can leave that slide up so folks can quickly write it down. The full report uh, is really amazing. And I think the in-depth interviews have provided a lot of information to us and to uh, other states, actually, even that we're getting calls from asking, you know, how did you do this? And what is, uh, what is the lessons that you're learning? So providing um, input for other states and researchers like Minnesota, Hawaii, and others, um, just from my own personal experience who've been calling us. So this is a really important tool. And I think even at the national federal level um, is, a, is a necessary tool to be able to usher us um, into what we might call environmental justice or climate justice at this point, looking forward to some of the, the impacts that are happening um, from weather disruption. So. Thank you. Um, I also want to highlight that, you know, we, we feel like this is very validating in the sense that many of the community members uh, across the state have been asking for the same thing. We want to be at the table. We want to be in the decision making. We don't want to be snuffed out by industry representatives and, and corporate lawyers uh, who fail to see um, the experiences that we live on an everyday basis. So um, I think that's that's right. Um, and I wanna thank you all for doing all of the hard work of this research and pulling it together during a pandemic. That is definitely something um, to be 
law it's very laudable and um i think that change is is made by many different mind skills um coming together to make the case right and this is one example of how communities and community researchers um, can work together to provide the kind of arguments necessary to advance policy. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, recently Governor Whitmer had announced uh, an executive order on climate and the My Healthy Climate um, Advisory Council is a place um, that residents can apply to be on that advisory board. And you know, I encourage environmental justice activists to apply to be on that so that you can have a say in how uh, health and the experience of the impact from pollution on your health is represented by the voices who have the lived experience. So you know, definitely look that up on the uh, website uh, for the state of Michigan. Um, so thank you all for this amazing work um, and I wish you the best in your careers in moving forward. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so Thanks much. Time. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Take care and have a great day. All right. Thank you.